So some helpful tools that I will suggest and kind of reference throughout the class is going to be, we have an app files guide on the cloud. We also have app files tutorials on our YouTube channel that both I and Drew have done. Then we also have the how to write a purchase and sale agreement guide in app files. I emailed that out earlier and then it's also in the chat. And then Drew teaches an app files class. Drew is our technology trainer. To those of you that are new to Harry Norman that have not met Drew, Drew Burr, he's been with Harry Norman for many, many years. He's our technology trainer and he has an app files class. I think it's come, it's either this week or next week. Don't have the calendar in front of me. But if you are new to Harry Norman, new to app files, I highly suggest you take that class. And again, that will be also on our YouTube channel as well. All right, next slide. So I really like to teach app files and working with buyers and sellers from the very beginning, start utilizing app files because app files truly is your file management system. It looks like a little manila folder and that is where you're gonna put all of your information for your client and your transaction. So you can certainly start using app files before you even go out to see a property when you're working with a buyer. And there are some steps that you can follow that are before taking your client to see properties. Okay, hold on one second. I've got someone waiting for me, I think. No, I don't see them anymore. I must have logged off. Okay, so before taking your clients to see the property, first thing you can do is create a new app file for your client. Go ahead and get that started before the hustle bustle of going out to see properties. Two, fill out any relevant file information that you can go ahead and complete before selecting the property. You can complete things like the buyer information, the closing attorney information, the selling broker information, which would be you because we are representing the buyer in this scenario. And then sign the exclusive buyer brokerage engagement agreement and go ahead and bind that in app files. It's always a best practice to have that discussion with your buyer before going out to see a property, go through the buyer brokerage agreement, explain your value and the steps that you're going to do in the process and go ahead and have that signed in app file ready to go. So when you go out to see a property and you're going to write an offer, you already have that piece of the puzzle done. And then lastly, you'll definitely want to make sure that you obtain your client's pre-approval letter and upload it into app files, because that is something you're going to do right after you have that initial buyer meeting. You're going to ask them if they've been pre-approved. If they've not, you will introduce them to your prosperity lender. They will have a conversation with them and send you that pre-approval letter. You'll want to also have a discussion with the lender so you can you know, know the <coughs> know the um, timelines that you'll need to put into the offer, such as appraisal and financing, because as you know, the lender really dictates a lot of the offer. So what we're going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and start a new share for my app files. So I'm going to go into Safari. All right. So when you sign into app files, can everyone see my app file screen now? Mm -hmm. Got it? Okay, I'm gonna yeah. make this yeah. a little larger. That's probably a little bit better. Mm -hmm. It is. All right. So when you sign into app files, this is your transaction and you know document management system. So there's a lot of different ways to get around in here. And as you become more comfortable with app files, you'll find your own personal route. But what you want to start with in this scenario, you have your new client, is you're going to select create new app file right here under your photo. And if you're brand new to Harry Norman, you may not have your photo in here yet. That's a step that you'll need to do in um, the back end. So you'll just select create new app file. And like I said earlier, this really is a file folder, <coughs> just like a Miller folder that would be in, a, in an old fashioned file cabinet. So what you're gonna want to do is 
insert the file name here. I always start before we find the property, I start off with the buyer's last name. So in this scenario, my buyers, their name is Jack and Jill Smith. So I'm just gonna title this one Smith. Then you go down to your file type and information. This is where you're gonna select where it's going to go in your agent workspace. So these are buyers. So I'm going to select buyers right here. And then it pulls, it pulls up some other fields that I can complete. So selling agent name, that is going to be used. That's going to be Tori Hughes. Branch, whatever office you are in, whether it's East Cobb, Woodstock, in-town. So let's say I'm in the in-town office. I would put that here. DPN number, we do not have that yet. That's going to be assigned once you go under contract. FMLS and Georgia MLS and Northeast Georgia MLS number. We have not even gone out to see a property yet. I just had my initial meeting with Jack and Jill, so I do not have any of those numbers yet. Buyer name one, I can go ahead and put Jack's name here and Jill's name here. Again, we don't have the sales price for the closing date because we've not found a property yet. Agent type. I am the selling agent in this scenario because I'm representing the buyer. Reload type, this is a personal referral. This is not a Harry Norman corporate reload referral. The Jack and Jill, they are friends of my parents. They, they got referred to me. And then transaction type, this is going to be a residential transaction. And then you can put any other information in here that you'd like to include in your file. Then you're going to select next. Now on this step, you can select users that you would like to add to your file. So if you look here, the ones on the right-hand side, these are selected by corporate. This is who is always gonna have access to your files. This is going to be your broker, your office staff, um, obviously, Jenny and Todd and Ashu for legal purposes need to have access. But let's say that you are working with a mentor. You have a mentor in your office. Let's say Sandy is my mentor. And I want Sandy to be able to have access to this file. So when I write my purchase and sale agreement and I have a question, I can say, Sandy, can you go check into my file and look at that and see if I did this correctly? Let me know what you think. By adding Sandy on here, I can give her access without having to send her the like PDF every time I need her to look at it. So I've added Sandy over here. You can see down here, Sandy's name and I create app file, okay? So you'll see under here, right in the center, this is that information. <laughs> then below it, you see who has file access, you see the date that I created it, who created it. And then this file mailbox, this is an email address. This is one of my favorite parts of app files. This is a unique email address to this particular app file for Jack and Jill Smith. So if I get that pre-approval letter from Prosperity and I want to put it in this app file, I can email it directly to the app file using this email address, or I can save it to my computer and upload it. There's various ways we can do this. Um, Drew goes into a lot of that in his classes. I'm not gonna go into the in depth because this is not App Files 101. We wanna talk you know, mainly about the um, process of putting everything into the contract. However, I do, want, I do like to point this out um, you can edit this. So see, it, this is a random number generated right here. But if I want to edit it and I can delete it and title it Jack and Jill Smith at appfiles.com. And now I've changed it so it's easier for me to remember. And I can copy it just like that if I want to put it into an email. All right, some other things that I can do at this point in the game. As you remember, we have not gone out to see any properties yet. 
we are strictly just setting up our file so this um, can save us time in the future. If you go over here on the right hand side where it says file information, I can go and add a section. And I can select, I want to put in the buyer information. And I can select create info section. So this is where I can enter all of Jack and Jill's information that I want to include that I may want to put into my contract or that I just want to keep here in case I need to reference it. So buyer name one, I could enter Jack Smith. Buyer email, let's say it's jacksmith at gmail.com. I want to put his phone number in here. I can do that. Um, going further down, I can go ahead and I can put Jill Smith in here. And then Jill Smith at gmail.com. I can also put their mailing address, et cetera, in here. For you know, sake of time, I'm not going to do all of that right now. Um, one thing to remember with app files, and this is just kind of going to come with practice and use. You don't, there's we're so used to hitting save, aren't we? To me, it's very counterintuitive that there's not a save button right here. <laughs> Uh, there's only a couple of times in app files we are going to see a save button. This is one of those instances where there's not a save button. So I just hit close and their information pops up here on the right hand side that I input it. There's other sections that you can add in here. As you saw, I could do listing agent info. I could put in selling broker and agent info, attorney info. There's a lot of different fields I can go ahead and create in here. Um, your individual offices may have specific ways they like their files to be set up. So I would just check with your managing broker and your office staff to see exactly how they like to see that right there. Um, another thing that you'll need to do at this time is your buyer brokerage engagement agreement. So now what you'll do is you'll go over here to add forms, this big green button right here on the left, click on that. And this is where you're going to find all of your forms. So again, there's different ways you can look for things. You can go to a forms package and scroll down. How I like to do it is I just like to go into the search and type in a keyword. So I would type in buyer. And you'll see right here, it pops up exclusive buyer brokerage agreement. So I can click on that. And then you see it pulls it over here into my selected forms section on the right hand side. I want it to be in my, this is where you choose the section right here. I'm just gonna put it in general paperwork for now. Again, your offices may have a specific place they want it to be, but this is where you can choose that. And add selected forms. Now you can see that it is in my app files to where I can complete it and send it to my buyer to sign. I'm not gonna go through how to do that right now and the ins and outs of the buyer brokerage agreement because we are not covering that today. If what's happening with my computer. Can you guys see that box that just popped up? Okay, hold on. I seem to be frozen. Your mouse is moving. Okay, now I'm unfrozen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so next thing I'm going to do is I received my, their um, pre-approval letter from Prosperity. So what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to upload that pre-approval letter that Prosperity sent me. So I can go to upload files. It's right under manage paperwork on the right. And I'll select browse down here on the bottom left because I've saved this to my computer. Like I said, you could also email it to yourself. So I will go and find where I have it saved. You guys, can you see where I'm searching? Mm -hmm. If I don't, sometimes it, the share doesn't let you see all this. 
Yeah. Okay. So I found where I saved their pre-approval letter. Now to my selected files and I click start upload. It tells me that they are uploaded and now it is in my uploaded paperwork, their pre-approval letter. So at this point, this is really all I can do until we find the property. So I'm gonna go back to our PowerPoint. Any questions at this point? <clears throat> awesome. Okay, let's go back. All right, is the PowerPoint back up for you guys? Yeah. All right. So moving right along, this is our scenario. We have Jack and Jill, their email addresses. They have found this beautiful property, 558 Boulder Crest Drive in Marietta. So we have the MLS number 6864539. And I know that they are pre-approved with Prosperity. So we have found the property. What do we do now? We've gone to see it. They decide they want to make an offer on it. So we're going to research the comparable properties on the MLS so we know how to construct our offer. We're going to call the listing agent. Very important step, especially in this market, but I would like to say in all markets, it's important to call the listing agent and discuss what's important to the seller may not just be price. They may need a specific closing date or temporary occupancy. Um, and then ask if there's an offer deadline. Again, very important in this market. Then you're gonna to want to obtain the seller's property disclosure and the community association disclosure if applicable, either from FMLS or the listing agent, if they need to email it to you. And then you'll want to upload that into app files into your file. Next, you'll also want to obtain the legal description from Campbell and Brannon. You can email them at attorney at campbellandbrannon.com. They will send you over the legal description for any property that you need. So you just need to email them and say, please send me the legal description for 123 Main Street. And a lot of times it's faster if you can also send them the um, seller's names. You'll want to discuss the key terms of the agreement with your client. Um, a little best practice is you may want to keep a template of all the key terms of the agreement saved somewhere on your phone. So when you're out and about and you're talking about the terms of the agreement, especially at the beginning, first couple of offers you write, so you make sure that you cover all these terms with your buyer. And then next, the next, this next slide, this is a key terms checklist that I've put together. These are obviously not all inclusive to every offer that you will be writing, but for the sake of this exercise, I wanted to include, you know, the most common thing you're going to be including in an offer. So the purchase price, if the closing, if the sellers want to be paying any closing costs, the closing date, possession date, closing attorney, earnest money, due diligence, special steps, financing terms, and the contingency periods, which are typically determined by the lender. And you've already had that conversation with the lender before you even go out to see the property. So you know these items. Um, like I said, maybe save these in a note in your phone. So when you're sitting there talking to your buyer, you, you don't leave anything out. You don't forget to discuss the due diligence period or who they want, uh, how much earnest money they want to deposit. Because as a new agent, first couple of times you write an offer, there will be times where you're going to, some of these things are going to escape your mind. So we want you to look like a pro to all of your clients. And I think having a checklist of some sort is always a good um, way to do so. All right, so we have done those steps and now it's time to write the offer. So before we go into this, what I want to do is I want to upload some of those documents that I referenced in that slide. So I'm gonna go back to my app file and I have just received the legal description 
and the seller's property disclosure from Campbell and Brand or from the listing agent. Another best practice that we like to encourage our agents to do is to print out the FMLS agent full sheet, F-U-L-L. -L. I spell it out because of my Southern accent, so you can make sure you understand what I'm saying. Um, we suggest that you upload that into app files too, because that is going to show you the commission percentage that the co-op agent is promising you as of the date that you're writing the offer. So we want to make sure we have a um, record of that in the event that it was to be changed. So you can either email these items to this app file using this app, this email address, or you can go back into upload files browse, find where you've saved these. So I have my FMLS listing, my seller's property disclosure, and my legal description. I've selected those and I'm going to select start upload. Go ahead and get these in my file. And now you can see all this uploaded paperwork here on the left-hand side under uploaded paperwork. All right, I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint. So we have all the information. We've discussed the terms of our agreement with our buyer. We have our key terms checklist. We have our pre-approval letter. It is time to write the actual offer. So we're gonna go back into the buyer's app file and go to add form. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna read through these steps. Then we'll go into app files and we'll do it together. So first we're going to go to add forms. Then we're going to select all the applicable forms and exhibits that we need to upload into this particular purchase and sale. Once we do that, we're going to merge that newly created purchase and sale with the disclosures and the legal exhibit that was previously uploaded. We'll also want to import the buyer information from into the app file. We can import the listing information in from FMLS also. That's a huge time saver I'm going to show you how to do. And then now it's time to fill in the blanks. Always remember that exhibits that were uploaded into app files from an outside source. So not, you know, the financing exhibit that is in app files, it's going to have a field already in there for the signature. But items such as the legal description or the seller's property disclosure, we're going to have to add those offer dates, the signature fields, et cetera. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. You want to always review for any blanks, errors, typos, et cetera. And then you'll want to sign and initial the purchase and sale agreement. Then you'll send the signature request to the buyers, which I know is a big question for some of you. So let's go back into app files and start writing the offer. All right. So first step was to go to add forms here on the left, same place that we went to get the um, buyer brokerage agreement. So we'll go to add forms, pulls up my available forms. So again, I'm just gonna type in purchase and this pulls up my F201, the purchase and sale agreement right here. What other exhibits am I going to need to upload into this contract? It, we know from our original discussion from, with our buyer and from our discussion with Campbell and Brandon and our pre-approval letter that we are using a conventional loan. So we want to upload the conventional loan contingency agreement. So I'm going to just type in a keyword for conventional. I can click on that. And it moves that form over here into my selected forms. Um, at this point, those are the only ones that I can pull in from the um, app files uploaded forms. The other, the other ones I'm going to have to merge that I uploaded myself. If we were going to do a um, temporary occupancy agreement or any other sort of exhibit that would need to be included, we could also do that at this time. Um, 
it's going to default to add these as a single merged form. That's what I want because most listing agents prefer you to send this over as one giant PDF, right? They don't want to, they don't want to receive 10 different attachments and you don't want to send 10 different attachments because you want to make sure they receive and open every part of your offer, right? So right now I'm going to choose to add these as a single merged form. What that means is I have two different forms in here. This is going to create one form versus keeping these separate. If I wanted to do them separate, I would click this box. Um, I can choose which section I want to put it in. I'm just going to keep it in general paperwork for this example. So now that I'm ready, I just select add selected forms. And it has now merged those two documents into one. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to close out of this because I need to also merge in my seller's property disclosure and my legal description. This um, particular home is not part of a community association with an HOA. So that's why I don't have a community association disclosure. So to merge my paperwork, I just click on right here under paperwork tools. I click on merge paperwork. It's right above that blue button where it says manage paperwork. So I'm going to click on that. So now what this does is it pulls up every document that I have currently in my app file for Jack and Jill Smith. So I'm going to select everything that I want to put into this one PDF. So first, I'm going to click on my purchase and sale agreement, which also, if you remember, has my conventional loan contingency agreement merged in there with it. Next, I want to include my seller's property disclosure and lastly, the legal description. So again, this is going to merge these together. I can change the order of these if I want. I, this is the order that I particular that I tend to put my contracts in. You may like to put your legal description first. Um, I think everyone has their own way of doing this. You can also, again, choose which section you want it in here. You can also change the form name by typing right here in this box. I'm going to do that in an, another section just to show you how to do it there, but just know that you can do it here as well. So once I'm happy with how it looks, I'm going to click on Merge Selected Items. So now you can see that I've gone from about 10 pages to 23 pages. Um, I can also click on Edit Pages right here. And this is going to show me everything in the app file or in this actual document in order like this. And you can also um, change the form order by clicking here on change form order. So say I did not want the legal description at the end. I wanted it right after the purchase and sale agreement. I can click and move things this way. So once I'm happy with that, I'll click save changes. I'm going to go back into my edit fields. So you remember on the previous screen, I was talking about changing the name of this form. So right here at the very top where it says F201, this is the current name of this form slash document. If I want to change it, I click on the pencil. And I, again, I think every office has a different way they like things to be named, or you may have a specific way you like it to be named. I always put the property address in. So this was 558 Boulder Crest Drive Southwest. And then if you don't want all this other stuff, you can delete it. And then when you're happy with it, this is one of those rare times in app files that you do have to check or save something to get it to, to be edited. So you just click that check mark and this form has been renamed. All right, so next up, you can import values 
from those um, fields that we did at the very, very beginning of class where we typed in Jack and Jill's information. That's why I told you this would be a time saver. So if I go to import values right here, this yellow, and I say import from an info field, this is going to show me where I have some information completed. So I have file information and buyer information where I put some values in. So I'm gonna select choose. And this is showing me the information that I have already input into this app file that I can now import into this form. I could have done this very same thing into my um, buyer brokerage agreement. So I'm happy with all of this. I'm gonna click start import and then done. So to show you what I just did, I will go to my signature page. And you can see here where that just imported Jack Smith and Jill Smith with their email addresses. This is another good way just to make sure that you don't have any typos by doing it that way. Um, down here where it has the affiliated licensees contact information, this is something that you can do in form values. That's a back end step on um, app files. And if we have time, I'll show you how to do that. That way, every time you pull up a purchase and sale agreement or a BBA or a listing agreement, all of your information will already be in there. Okay. I have not done it this year since the um, new contracts came out. So that's why mine's blank. It is something you're going to have to do annually because we get new forms. All right. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to import the FMLS information because right now I have no property address. I have no listing agent information. And instead of having to print out my FMLS sheet and, you know, hand type that in and risk a you know, typo or transposing a number, I can click on import values again. And now I'm going to click on import from FMLS. So I'm going to go in here and type in my FMLS number. Then I will click search. And it's going to pull in that address, the 558 Boulder Crest. That's the correct address and select choose. Now I go in here and this shows me all the information that it can pull into my form. And I can select, you know, which pieces of the puzzle I want to include and which ones I don't. So for instance, I know I'm going to upload the um, legal description. So I'm going to leave these blank because that's not how I'm going to identify the property. I do want this other information. I definitely want all of the listing agents information and the listing broker. I do have to acknowledge this is coming from a third party site. And then I click start import. So it tells me 18 values have been imported into my form and I'm going to select done. So now you can see right here, my address, my tax parcel ID. Yeah. Be careful going home. So my tax parcel ID, everything has been uploaded. If I scroll down, the listing agent to Harry Norman agent too. So that's been uploaded. I keep going to my signature page where the bulk of the information is going to be here on the um, listing agent's information. So I've had agents take this class before that they're just blown away because they've been using app files for five years sometimes and never need to do that. So uh, that's again, probably after the email address function of this, that's my second favorite app files feature for sure. Any questions before we move on? Hey, Tori, I have a question for you. Sure. What, when you were first setting up, okay, why don't mm -hmm. you just go ahead and go to the master, uh, the master bu uh, buyer template and fill that okay. in. Yeah, you can do that too. Okay, to me that would, I do mine that way because it's a lot easier because you can pull everything. Everything in. Everything yep. in at one time, you don't have to worry about going back and forth. Back and forth, yep. So let me show you guys what Al's referring to. 
me move you. Okay, so if I close out of here and I go over to my file information, I click on add section. I could have clicked on the master buyer template and then create. And it's giving me a lot of information here as well that I can go ahead and input. Um, were you referring to the property information, Al? So you could definitely import it into here as well and then import that into your form. It's just, like I said or, or at the beginning, there's so many different ways to do things in app files. It's really just what is your personal preference um, and what intuitively makes sense to you or what your office prefers. But really good point, thank you for sharing that. All right, so I'm gonna go back into my purchase and sale agreement and we can start filling in the blanks. So first up, I have my offer date, which is today. And I love this little calendar function that didn't used to be here. So you just click on that and look, there's your date. So going down, we already have this information completed. It came straight from FMLS. Next, I'm going to check the box for attaching it as an exhibit then best practice is to not leave any blanks in your contract. So I always put NA in all of my blanks. Here, whoops. No, I have there. All right. Next blank is the purchase price. So we're not really going over strategy in this class <laughs> today. We're just going over how to fill in the blanks. So we're offering full price for this property, which was $775. We are asking the seller to contribute $5,000 to the closing costs, which I know in this market, we're not really seeing. But again, this is just a general exercise. Closing date, we talk to our clients and to Prosperity and they can do a 30 day close. So we're gonna look at the calendar and we talk to our clients. The 10th doesn't work for them. The 11th is Friday. So we're gonna choose March 11, 2022. Um, another little pro tip, best practice, especially for new agents. Don't just assume that a closing date is going to work for your clients just because it's 30 days out. Have your clients take out their calendars or their phones or whatever they use and make sure that date actually works for them. <laughs> These things can always be changed, but in this competitive market that we're in, a seller may not want to change the date after the fact. Um, also make sure that you're not writing an offer with a closing date for a Saturday. Um, that may not make your offer very appealing to a, to a seller if you don't even care to check the calendar to look, see what day of the week this is. So just some pro tips for this hot market. All right, next up, you're gonna select that you are going to have possession at closing. So we are going to put some NAs in these blanks. Closing law firm, we are doing Campbell, whoops, I can't type when you guys are watching me. Campbell and Brannon. And then I don't know the phone number off the top of my head, but let's just pretend like this is their phone number. Make sure that you put the branch phone number for the office that you want to close in. If it is an attorney like Campbell and Brandon that has multiple offices, I often like to specify here which location it is. This new addition of adding the phone number, I think is going to help some confusion, but again, Putting in the location is always helpful. Yeah. Holder of earnest money. We always prefer it to be Harry Norman. And it's also very easy on your clients because they can go into our online earnest money deposit system on Harry Norman's um, website and they, can, they don't have to go to the bank. They don't have to call their bank. They just go on and deposit it like that. If you are using Harry Norman's online deposit system for earnest money, that is an ACH, check ACH. That's not a wire transfer, it is an ACH. So just make a little note of that. Then 
we have talked with our buyers and we're going to select B. And we said $10,000. And I think I said within five days of binding agreement date. So we'll complete that here. Again, I'm going to put an NA in my blanks just to make my offer super clean. Um, I don't know if uh, you guys have heard about, there was a house a couple of weeks ago in Swanee where there were 155 offers received on the property. And I know it's not an urban legend because actually one of our Harry Norman agents is the agent that was the winning offer. So I know this isn't an urban legend. Um, and then I also saw on Facebook, the email that the agent, the listing agent sent out to all of the um, buyer's agents that did not, that their offer was not accepted. And she laid out exactly, you know, we received 70 offers over 500,000, you know, gave a lot of information, but what I really appreciated seeing was, you know, the things that the buyer's agents did that were, went above and beyond. One thing was good communication. Another thing was a very clean contract submitted exactly as they requested it. So when you're, you may think that some of these things are tedious that I'm suggesting you do, but in this market, we need to do everything we can do to help our buyers win these offers. And if making sure we don't leave any blanks in the contract does that, then that is going to make you shine. Um, due diligence period. We said seven days. So again, we're not going to do any option money with this. So we're just going to put an in NA in that blank. Lead-based paint. This was, and I don't know what year it was constructed, but I do know it was after 1978 because it's newer construction. So we're gonna check that box. Make sure you do not leave this blank. Brokerage relationships. Harry Norman is representing the buyer and the seller. What would this be? Anyone know? Uh, dual agency. Yeah. Is it dual agency? So Tori Hughes is representing the buyer and Hicks Malonson is representing the seller. No, it's not dual agency. That would actually be designated agency. Thank you, Courtney. So you would ch check the designated agent box. And then I'm representing the buyer. So you put Tori Hughes and Hicks Malonson from the historic Marietta office is representing the seller. So dual agency would be if Hicks was representing the seller he had an open house and an unrepresented buyer came in and all parties agreed that he could represent both parties. We do allow that at Harry Norman. We don't encourage it because there can be a lot of gray area. We just don't feel that you can properly represent either party, you know, in their best interest. Um, and you know, there is a section on both the listing agreement now and the buyer brokerage agreement where both parties have to consent prior to, to allowing that. So um, just something to talk through with your buyers and your sellers when you're going over those agreements. Um, there are no material relationships to disclose, but say Jack and Jill Smith were my cousins or my brother or something like that, I would need to put that in here. Time limit of offer. Well, when I called Hicks and asked him when these offers were due, he told me they were going to be due by five o'clock on the 10th. So I'm going to put my expiration, I'm gonna do it for five o'clock PM on the 11th. That's gonna give him 24 hours to review this before it expires. So I'm not gonna go through the contract we have other classes for that. We're just going through how to complete this today. Keep scrolling down. All right. So on number eight, this is where we're going to check which exhibits and addenda that we're including. So let's go through here. We do not have a community association. We do have a conventional loan contingency. We do have a legal description. 
and we have a seller's property disclosure statement. So I'm now going to add letters because exhibits are lettered and addendums or uh, uh, amendments, I'm sorry, are letter or number. So the order I put it in, my conventional loan contingency exhibit, I put that in as A. Next, I think I put my seller's property disclosure. So I'm gonna make that one B. And then my legal description is C. And then special stipulations. So this is a very small section, isn't it? <laughs> I think that they knew when they did these forms this year that we're not putting a lot of special stipulations in our contracts right now. But if you were and you need more space than this, you can always attach an additional page. Um, if you click on the special stipulations, you can certainly just go in here and type a special stipulation or copy and paste something you already have written. If you click up here under save clauses, we have a plethora of saved special stipulations in here, all the way from ones that Harry Norman has written to Red Book special steps from Seth Wiseman. Then we have all of the GAR ones. So if we're not attorneys, we don't want to try to pretend like we're one. So instead of recreating the wheel every time we write a contract, we could simply search in here to see if one has already been written that suits our needs. So we said in this scenario that the seller was going, we were going to ask the seller to provide a home warranty. So I'm going to type in warranty for a keyword and it pulls up any special stipulations that are already in here that include the word warranty. So this one at the beginning, this looks like a good one for me. So I'm gonna click on it. Then if I scroll down, I can say insert at the beginning, insert at the end or click to clipboard. So that would be if you have multiple special stipulations already in there. I'm only gonna do one, so it doesn't really matter if I do beginning or end, I'm gonna click insert at the beginning. And then you'll see here in my blank that it went ahead and put in this pre-written special stipulation. So I always number my special steps. I think that's really helpful, especially in the event that you have counter offers flying back and forth. You can just simply say all parties agree to remove special step number four or something like that versus having to write out the whole special step that you're removing. So, in this example, it says at or, below, at or before closing, seller agrees to reimburse buyer for the actual cost of a home warranty of the buyer's choosing up to the following amount. If buyer selects a home warranty, which costs in excess of this sum, any overage shall be paid for by buyer. So I've called my Harry Norman insurance agent and for home warranty. And they quoted me 700 for this warranty. So I'm just going to put $700 in there. I always like to add in here that selling broker shall order warranty. That way you could order it and choose which home warranty company you want. And then save changes. And now you can see that my special step is in my form. All right, scrolling down, we already have Jack and Jill's information here on the signature page. We have all of Hicks's information, the listing agent. My information is here with my name Then I would enter in all of my other information. I'm gonna show you at the end how to put this into form values. So it's in every purchase and sale agreement that you write going forward. Um, if you don't wanna do form values, you can always go ahead and put your information in here every time, but the form values is a time saver. And then finding agreement date, we all know that we don't fill that in now. The last person to receive notice of acceptance is the one that's going to complete the binding agreement. All right, next up in our contract is a special stipulations page with our COVID steps in it. Um, that we include these in every contract. So these are, you know, the standard boilerplate language. And you'll see down here, the initial fields are already activated. The next page is our affiliated business 
disclosure statement. This is something that's in all contracts as well. So the consumer knows that we have relationships with these various service providers. And as you see, the signature fields are already here also. Then we have our wire fraud warning page, again, included in every contract. Next up is our loan contingency exhibit. So at the top, I'll put, this was exhibit A. Then you'll see that my date and my property address are already completed in here from when I imported those fields from the FMLS, so huge time saver. Next up, I'll check for my first mortgage loan. I know all this information from the pre-approval letter and talking to the lender. They are going to put down 20%, so I'm going to put an 80% loan amount. They are doing a 30-year loan. Their interest rate was 3.5, and this is fixed and an institutional loan. I'm going to put NAs in my blanks. All right, going down under number two, the use of a particular mortgage lender. Um, like I said earlier, this is not really a forms class. This is more of a how-to class, but best practice when you're representing a buyer, you don't want to put anything in this blank. Sometimes listing agents want you to, and that's something you will have to determine, but Best practice is not to put anything in this blank. And the reason why is if your buyer were to get denied a loan and they need to submit the loan denial letter, the form states that the loan denial letter must come from any lender that's in this blank. So it, the only time that would really come into play is if they were trying to get out of the contract based on a loan denial letter. That's just something to remember that it's not necessarily protective to put the um, approved mortgage lender in here. And if you have more questions about that, we can chat offline. Financing contingency. We had 18 days in here. We talked to our lender and I know that this is probably really long <laughs> for right now for what you guys are seeing in the market. I think we're seeing zero days a lot of times to be competitive. Um, but I'm just, this is just for example purposes. Same with appraisal contingency. I know 18 days probably seems like two years right now in this market. So again, this is not a, not a um, negotiation class, more of a how-to. Then going down to our signature page, Jack and Jill's names have carried forward. Then I need to put in Harry Norman here. My name carried forward, and then you need to put your realtor membership. I'm in Atlanta Realtors Association. All right, then I'm going to go on to my next page. So now we have the seller's property disclosure statement. Um, you'll notice that this form looks a little different than my conventional loan contingency did. That's because this one was uploaded from an outside source. Remember, I got this one from the listing agent. So I'm going to need to edit this form to get those blanks to pop up. This, is, this was essentially just a PDF. So I need to click on edit. And by opening this edit field, I can basically mark up this form. So the first thing I want to do is on this left-hand side right here where my mouse is, I'm gonna click on add new element text. So when I click on text, it gives me this plus sign and I can put that wherever I want to add text. So I need to put a B right here. So I'm gonna click there and it pulls up my element box and I just type in a B. I can change the alignment, change the font size, make it bold click create, and now I have my B in there. I'm gonna do the same thing for my offer date. So I've got to click text again. Offer date is February 10th, 2022. Click create. You see my February 10th. Mm -hmm. Say I want, I need to move it. 
I need to move an element, all I have to do is click on it and it turns orange and then I can drag it somewhere else. So I can put it back right here. And when I'm done with it, I just click off of it. Next, I need to add the address. I'm gonna do the very same thing. And I'll type in the 558 Boulder Press Drive. What was it? I think it was North Southwest or something. I can, you just, I, if this was a real contract, I would double and triple check it. And then it was in Marietta. Obviously in Georgia, and then I do text again for the zip. It was three zero zero six four. Whoops. All right. So this looks great. I know that the next thing I need to do is go to my signature page. I click till I get to my signature page. And obviously my buyer would have gone through this. We would have asked any questions we needed to. So I am now at my signature page and I still have my edit page up. Let's say I didn't have my edit page up. I closed out of it and I go to my signature page. That edit tab is going to be on every page that has the edit function. So I'll just click it again. And I need to add some information here about my buyer. So the first thing I'm going to do is add text. And I'm going to put Jack Smith's name right here. And do the same thing for Jill. Next, I need to add their signature. So I can send out a signature request for the entire contract as one item. So I need to click on the left under my elements, add signatures, I'm going to select the role. So by, Jack is buyer number one. So buyer signature, I do want to display the date. So I'm gonna click place signature. Again, it's gonna give me this plus sign. So I put it wherever I want his signature to go. Again, if I want to move something around, all I do is click on it. So I clicked on the date and I'm just going to drag it down to the date. I can click on the signature and move it up, move it down, move it wherever I want it to be. Then I just click off of it. I need to add Jill's now. So I'm just going to click buyer signature two, place signature and do the exact same thing for Jill. All right, I'm going to close out of this. So I have their signatures ready to go when I'm ready. Now I'm going down to the legal description. Now, this is just for the sake of my exercise. Obviously, this would have the deed and be the real, real legal description if we were writing a real contract. So same thing here. I need an initial on here, and I also need to label it as Exhibit C. So I'm going to click edit again. I'm going to click text, place my plus sign, and type it in exhibit C. I'm going to make this bigger so it shows up, make it bold, and click create. So now I have exhibit C, so I have this labeled. I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to add initials for them to initial it. So I'm going to go to add initials and click on buyer initials with display date, place initials, put it on here. I need to do buyer initial two for Jill and put it on there also. All right, I'm gonna close out of my add edit page elements. And next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to review my contract. Make sure I don't have any blanks anywhere. Make sure everything's filled out correctly. I don't have any typos. 
All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. All right, so next up is sending the signature request to the buyer. So before I send them the signature request, obviously you're gonna know your buyers. If this is the you know, fifth or sixth contract you guys have written together, they know the drill. They may just want you to send it over for them to read it themselves. If they're first time home buyers or they're just more detail oriented, you may need to call them, walk them through it together before you send them the signature requests. Um, just make sure that you, you know, ask them what they feel more comfortable with, et cetera. So going back to our contract, it is now time for me to sign it. So I need to click on sign now, right here underneath electronic signatures. I'm gonna click sign now. And I'm gonna select the fields I want to sign. So I'm the selling agent and I need to sign the purchase and sale agreement. I need to sign the conventional loan contingency agreement, but I do not sign the seller's property disclosure, obviously. So I'm gonna click next. Then I'm gonna type my name in, choose whichever font you want, and then click next. I'm going to accept my signature. And if you scroll down, you can see where I have signed. I also need to initial a couple of pages. So I'll click initial now. And I need to initial the purchase and sale agreement. So I'll click selling agent initials next. And I see to type in my initials, choose my font, click next, accept it. And then you can see where I signed that COVID step page. All right, so I have signed it. I called Jack and Jill, we walked through it together. I sent them a PDF copy and now they are ready for me to send them the signature requests. So what I'm going to do is there's a couple of different ways to do this. I like to do it by clicking this big blue button in the middle of the page that says request signatures. Then start signature request. So what this says right here is if you are creating um, signature requests for more than one party, in this case, we have two buyers, Jack and Jill, we have to create two separate requests. It's not like Dot Loop or some of those other platforms where it's a chain reaction where after I sign and Jack signs and then after he signs, it sends it to Jill. We have two separate requests that go out, which is actually more advantageous, I believe, because if Jack is busy in a work meeting and he doesn't sign for an hour, Jill can't sign it until he's done, right, in this scenario. Um, sending two separate requests, it doesn't matter when Jack signs, Jill can go ahead and do so. So let's click start a signature request. I'm going to type in the signer's full name, Jack Smith. Then I'm going to select all the signature fields and initial fields that I need him to sign. So I, he is buyer number one. I click on that on, and it activates all of the purchase and sale agreement, conventional loan contingency, and the seller's property disclosure. Then he also needs to initial on the purchase and sale and the legal description because I have added this legal description initial on here on the front hand. Same thing with the SPD. If I had not added those elements, those would not have showed up in here because those were two outside documents. I had to physically go in and add those elements. So I'm happy with this. I'm going to click next. These are some editable fields that I can give him um, access to edit. I don't want him to be able to edit the time limit of the offer, so I'm not checking those. Clicking next. So I will type in his email address, but if you remember, I already typed it in when I did my form values. So I just click on jacksmith at gmail.com. 
there's a pre-populated um, message, you can edit this though. If you want it to you know, not be so formal, you can edit this message. I'm not going to click next and actually send this because I'm sure there is a jacksmith at gmail.com out there and he would go and be like, what the heck? Am I buying a house? I had no idea. So this would be the process to go through for Jack and we would do the same exact process for Jill to send that out. And once you click next, then it prompts you to send it. All right, any questions about the electronic signatures? All right, I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. Lori? Yes. Do you change, all right, let the, in fact, I can, where it says general paperwork, mm -hmm. then we have to put buyer, because Becky has to have it, we have to put it in the buyers. Yes, so that's where I was saying that every office yeah. Yeah. Puts, and puts it in different places. So I just, when I teach this class, I just leave it in general because okay. if, I, if I start telling you where to put it, yeah. it's going to be different for every office. So check with your office staff if you're a new agent. I'm sure most, you know, listing and transaction coordinators would be happy to sit down with you if they don't have a manual or something like that because Ultimately, when you put it in the right place, it makes their job easier. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't have to send you a reminder to do it. So if you're new and you have some questions, or if you're not new, you just have never thought about this, just go ahead, ask them for a meeting. They'll walk you through it, exactly where to put it. All right. So now it is finally time to submit the offer. So we are going to open the purchase and sale agreement and app files. And so going back to the signatures, once Jack and Jill sign it, I'm going to get an email that they've signed it. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to keep going into app files and refreshing to see if they've signed. I will get an email once they've signed. Um, so once I know that ba they both have signed and most of the time your clients are going to be ready to get their offer over. So they'll probably text you or call you once they've signed it too. Um, but you'll go into app files, you'll open back up the document You'll select send via email and then send via email PDF. Um, you can select edit attachments to choose any additional documents to send. So that would be if you want to send your pre-approval letter with it. You can send that in the same email so you're not sending multiple emails. I'll show you how to do that. Um, best practice is to send the pre-approval letter with the offer. Um, number five. Very important. Always request the listing agent confirms receipt of the offer in the email. Another best practice would be to always call the listing agent to let them know you're sending an email. Yep. It's, especially when these agents are getting 10 plus offers on every house, you want to make sure they know to expect yours. Also, try to sell your client to them. Sell yourself. Sell, you know, you know, the, their communication and your communication and how seamless this, you know, transaction will be um, if they've already been through underwriting. Tell the listing agent that. Have your loan officer call the listing agent and let them know how solid their financing is. Because especially right now where we are up against so many cash offers, that one phone call from the prosperity lender may make or break you getting the contract, right? So don't just send it. Make sure someone knows that you're sending over the offer. And then congratulations, you have submitted your offer. Let's go back to app files so we can talk about how we send it. So let's say I just got my emails that said that Jack and Jill have signed. So I'm just going to go back into my purchase and sale agreement. I'm going to click on it. And up here at the top where it says send via email in the green, I'm going to click on that. And then send via email PDF. I'm going to click on that. Um, right here is where I said there's many different ways to send a signature request or to get to that stage. This is another way to get to it versus clicking on the signature request button. So send via email, PDF. 
All right. So do you see this compose email box? Did that pop up for you guys? Uh, no. No. So there's not a box that says compose email? Nope. Okay, I think I have to share that too. Thank you. All right, now do you see it? Yep. Okay, yeah. so in here, you're gonna type in the listing agent's um, email address. So it was Hicks Malonson at HarryNorman.com. So I type in the listing agent's email address, then it's automatically going to have my purchase and sale agreement attached because that's the document that I was in. But like I said, we want to also send over our pre-approval letter. So if I click on edit attachments, this is going to pull up every document in this particular app file for Jack and Jill Smith. So this is why I said it's a great practice to go ahead and upload your pre-approval letter. So I'm going to click on that. And if there was something else I needed to send over, like a proof of funds or something like that, I could select that here and click finish. So now you see, I don't only have my purchase and sale agreement. I also have my pre-approval letter attached. Then here, this is my subject. So I'm going to type in 558 Boulder Crest Offer or however you want to title your offer. Then I'll type in my message to Hicks. Um, I think right now a good best practice is to kind of highlight some of the key terms of the agreement in this email to the listing agent. So, you know, again, when they're sifting through a bunch of offers, if you make it easy for them by putting it here, you know, they're definitely going to go check you. <laughs> but I just think that shows that you're going above and beyond and the type of communication that this listing agent's going to have with you throughout this transaction. And then you will select send message. And again, please make sure you call the listing agent and also put a little line in here that says, please confirm receipt. All right, now I'm going to go back to our PowerPoint. So we have submitted the offer. And now we're just waiting till five o'clock tomorrow night to see if it gets accepted, right? <laughs> um, some pro tips for writing an offer and app files. Use the key terms discussed with your client as a guide. That's why I said it's such a good idea. The key terms that I have highlighted that I talked with Jack and Jill through, save that as a note on your phone, save it as you know a document on your computer. So you can just copy and paste those. You could even just copy and paste it into your email to the listing agent. Um, before sending signature requests to your buyers, call them to walk through the contract, highlighting the key terms discussed. Um, like I said earlier, you're gonna know your buyers. You're going to know how much handholding they need or don't need. Don't leave any blanks. Um, special stipulations, use the pre-written special steps and app files or consult Campbell and Brannon, your broker, your mentor. Um, we're not attorneys. We don't want to um, get in trouble because we think that we've written something covering your client and protecting them when actually we've you know, forgotten a piece of the puzzle. So if, it's a, if you're writing a special stipulation that is rare or one you've never written before, chances are your broker has probably seen it and may have something that you can use as a guide um, or Campbell and Brandon does. So don't be afraid to ask for help. They are here for you as a resource, especially Campbell and Brandon. They'll be happy to help you out. Um, exhibits are lettered, amendments are numbered. And then for the legal description, the best practice is to attach a copy as an exhibit. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing. So I can see the room for those of you that have your cameras on. Um, do we have any questions? We have a couple minutes before our time is up. So if we have any specific questions about app files and writing the contract, I'd be happy to answer those. This was helpful. Good, Sandy. I'm so glad. Good. You have um, to just sit and play with it. Yes. And I mean, those of you that are new, 
and this you're like I've never opened out files before or I've never written a contract before this is all overwhelming you're not the only one <laughs> I mean I remember when I first started I was thinking how am I ever going to write a contract in less than five hours <laughs> or however long it took, you know, calling my mentor every five seconds, you know, my handwritten scratch notes on my computer and it gets faster. I promise. It's just I was going to ask you how long should I, I gauge myself as a newbie? <laughs> oh, a while. A, while. <laughs> a couple of hours. I would Thank say. you. <laughs> I, and don't, that's why I think it's important to take this class and to practice. So, David, I mean, I would say pick a property and go from start to finish with the process and, you know, see how you do, see what you have trouble with, call, call a buddy, call a mentor, call your broker, have them review it, because um, really practice makes perfect. And, you know, you're doing, you just did Agent Accelerate, you're doing this class now, and it could be three or four months before you write a contract. I don't know. You know, I mean, we hope it's sooner, but you just never know. And so if you don't look at this again until that time comes, you may it be like starting from scratch. So I would say practice makes perfect. Um, also, the good thing about the pandemic is we started the YouTube channel. So you can go and watch this video anytime. It's already on there. You just have to listen to me. <laughs> hey, Tori, one of the best things you can do also is to do a test file, just like she just finished uh, describing, <laughs> do a test file and send it to one of the agents in your office and just yes. go back and forth just to make sure so you can understand the process. Because once you get it, it's not that complicated. Once right. you get it, it's pretty easy. There's a certain format that you follow and like anything else, you've got to get used to doing it. And since we don't do it every day, it takes us a little longer to actually get a good grip of everything. Yeah. Thanks, Al. And one thing you could do, David, to practice with actually sending the signature request, I mean, you probably have a Gmail account yourself or, you know, send it to yourself mm -hmm. as a practice well, signature request. I love that idea. And that way, it's to me, I'm seeing it. Mm -hmm. I can relax yeah, with it. And you're yeah. seeing what the client's going to see, which yeah. I think is um, a big, a big benefit. Um, Debbie, remind us how to, oh, thank you. I was going to show you that. So she said, remind us how to automatically fill in our name, office codes, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, this is a good one. So let me go back to app files. So this is something that you can do. Um, you'll need to do it every time the forms change, because once we upload new forms, this is going to go away. So GAR does updates usually January and mid-year. So let's go to my app files home. So this is what you're going to see right when you get into app files. If you go to your photo and right beside it, if you want to change your photo, click on my photo. If there's, you need to change some settings, you click settings. But form values is what I want you to click on. So once you go in here, you're going to click on the form that you want to put the values in. So I don't suggest doing this for every single form unless you just have a ton of time on your hands. I would do it for the ones that are going to be used the most. So purchase and sale agreement, buyer, buyer brokerage agreement, and the listing agreement. I would do those three at the, at the minimum. So for the, um, let's go to the purchase and sale agreement. Where does it, did I pass it? There it is. So you find the form that you want to do and click purchase and sale agreement. So anything that I fill out under form values is going to be in any purchase and sale agreement that I ever do. And you obviously, if you mess up, you can change. You can go back and delete it. So the things that are important are going to be my information. That's never going to change on any offer that I write. So let's go down to the signature page. 
So this is a purchase and sale agreement. So when I'm writing one, I'm going to be representing the buyer. So I would go in here and type in my information. Put in my phone number. My fax number, my email address. My realtor membership. Then so forth and so on with my broker's address, my broker's phone number, the MLS office code, and the brokerage firm license number. If you do not know these, just ask your office staff. They can provide you with these. Um, so once I'm done completing that, I'm going to scroll to the top and just click close. And I could go back into form values and do that for the listing agreement or the buyer um, brokerage agreement but to see if it worked, okay? One thing that you can do is you can go into print blank forms. And I'm just gonna type in that purchase during an info call. They told me they really wanted to move forward, but weren't sure if they wanted to add website design onto their package. So we started discussing some things we could work on together during our project to improve their website. Doing this for over three years, I should have stopped right there. I know this was a huge red flag, but I let my kindness and enthusiasm about the potential project get the best of me. After they told me they wanted to move forward, I spent a lot of time writing up the contract and sending over a link to pay their deposit. After a week of not hearing back and no response to any of my follow-up emails, I realized they updated their website themselves with the things that we talked about during our call. They totally wasted my time and took advantage of me. I feel like this really makes me regret being so nice. I had a client steal my ideas during an info call. They told me they really wanted to move forward, but weren't sure if they wanted to add website design onto their package. So we started discussing some things we could work on together during our project to improve their website. Doing this for over three years, I should have stopped right there. I know this was a huge red flag, but I let my kindness and enthusiasm about the person. I had a client. But I walked on the set and like, you know, All right, are you guys there? Yes. I have no idea what that was. <laughs> it sounded, I mean, I couldn't even, it's, I don't have any other things pulled up. That was so bizarre. Okay, I'm going back. Sorry about that. All right, back into app files. I want to see if my form values worked. I'm going to go to my signature page and look, there it is. So if you see my name, my email address, my realtor association, all that is in there. So huge time saver. Um, and how I did that just one last time was I went to form values right by my picture and clicked on the form that I wanted to put that information in. Oh, Nikita, okay, she says, sorry, I'm babysitting and the kiddo walked by with her phone. Yeah, <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> okay, I just could not figure out where it was coming from. <laughs> I didn't realize I was on mute until I looked over. I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? I was like, oh. <laughs> I'm just glad I'm not going crazy. Okay. <laughs> like, where is this browser open? <laughs> it's time for my afternoon coffee.